I'll start with this. I hope you can all hear me. Is that all right? Well, I'll shout a bit and hope that you can. Well, first, first of all, thank you all for coming this evening. I appreciate it. Otherwise, I'd be standing here in an empty room talking to myself, um, which I suppose is an occupational habit of physicists as well. Um, and uh, that wouldn't be, I don't think, quite as much fun. So what I want to do today is to share with you some things which I've been given the title of the wonders of physics. And physics, of course, is everywhere, as Elisabetta has just said. Everything we do, everything we touch in the modern world, has something connected with physics. Uh, and physics is in the news. I'm not sure we necessarily all understood it, but physics was in the news as of yesterday when it was announced that the primordial gravity waves have been uh, detected, and that seems to put us all the way back in contact with the, the Big Bang, the first fractions of a second of the existence of the universe. So that's the kind of subject that physicists can be involved in, as well as perhaps more everyday things. So I thought to start, um, I hope you all know what wonders are. I hope by the end of the evening we'll have some ideas of some other wonders of physics. But I thought we might think about, first of all, what is physics? It's a subject which tends to get a kind of gasp of, um, I don't know what it is, the admiration or fear if people say that you're involved in any way with physics. Um, I don't quite know why it is. It doesn't help, I suppose, that the dictionary definition is this kind of dry one, which is the study of matter, energy, and the interaction between them. Well, all right, but what it really means is asking questions about anything in the universe and trying to answer them. Trying to answer them by carrying out sensible and well-constructed experiments and thinking about what the answers you get from those experiments are. Then asking some more questions. It ends up that you uh, are simply a curious person, just want to know how things work, why things happen, how things are. And as far as physics is concerned, we go from everywhere, from the origin of the universe to uh, far into outer space to nanotechnology and the really uh, sub-visible microscopic zone. So everywhere is in reach of physics. And physicists are there asking questions about any of those topics and trying to answer them. And uh, I'll start with a quote from Albert Einstein. There are plenty of quotes by Albert Einstein about a variety of topics. He clearly thought long and hard about what he was doing. And one of his pieces of advice, which uh, is a brilliant one uh, to all of us interested in the way the world is, is to look deep into nature. And then you'll understand everything better. And so tonight I want to look deep into nature and hope we can have a little bit of better understanding. Now, I can't take a whole lot. I suppose, as a professor, I should be able to talk as long as it took from the origin of the universe until now. Um, I'm supposed to like the sound of my own voice, but I'm not intending to do that. And I'm not going to cover every conceivable topic and every conceivable scale. What I thought we might do is think a bit about what some of the things that physicists do are, and then have a, a quick selection and look at three topics, three areas, in reasonable detail. I found a few things, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. They produce energy. They treat cancer. In fact, they partly diagnose cancer as well as treat it. Develop new electronic devices. <coughs> We're all used to the mobile phone, which is a phenomenal piece of technology, and we take it for granted. We look at mobile phones. We make new materials. We understand the climate. We may not understand the weather, there's a subtle difference, but we certainly think we understand something about the climate. We study space, the solar system and beyond, and we investigate fundamental particles. Probably the most recent news story before the one on the primordial gravity waves was the discovery of the Higgs boson. Again, most people trying to explain it on the news didn't get anywhere, but there is a particle there and to the point in discovering experimentally. So physicists are interested in the fundamental particles, the building blocks of all the matter that we encounter all around us. So I'm going to choose for my wonders of physics something from everyday life. 
and I thought I'm going to have a great time when I put this lecture together. <coughs> what sort of things can I think about about the physics of everyday life? And of course, the first thing I start to think about is uh, anything that's got sort of high technology. Because we immediately think that physics goes there. But I'm going to talk about, first of all, climate. Now, climate, we're all aware of that. It's a reasonably mild night tonight. Most people arrive with you know, coats but not max and umbrellas. We're all interested in this topic, and it is an example of a realm in which physics has an awful lot to tell us. I can't resist mobile phones, so I won't. I can put something here about mobile phones. And finally, because it's my area of research, I want to say something about materials. We're not going to be talking about the materials I personally have worked on, but we'll have a look at some aspects of materials and what we know about them, what we can understand about them. So now let's turn to climate. Now climate is another piece of physics that was in the news, though most people wouldn't recognise it as physics. Here's the sort of climate that we saw not very long ago in the recent winter. Here's somebody driving along in quite a stormy day. Here's an even more spectacular one from the coastal region of Devon. And we were struck by a series of really heavy storms this winter, and uh, that's the kind of thing that climate scientists are interested in. Not just tracking the weather in some uh, just recording, uh, recording events way, but understanding it, trying to predict what might be happening. And so climate physics has emerged as a discrete but important subject. It's the application of physics to the study of the climate. Now, I've talked about climate, so I thought I ought to say for us, what's the difference between climate and weather? And I've got a couple of quotes here. And uh, really, if you like, weather is, you put your nose out the door, is it raining tonight? No, that's the weather. Uh, climate is, what's the average temperature in the last 12 months or the last five years or something like that. So the... Weather is, if you like, the local and immediate manifestation of climate, and the climate is the average of the weather over long enough time. And physicists are really interested not so much in predicting the weather, though uh, the people who work in the meteorological office are largely uh, physicists, and meteorology is a branch of physics, um, but the people who are interested in perhaps longer term duration of understanding the weather and predicting it more considered climate scientists. So climate. Now how does climate and physics go together? Well, there are several features of climate that are clearly physical. In fact, they all are, really. Um, but there are several features that are obvious. One is temperature. And it's worth saying that the temperature of our Earth is controlled mainly by the output of radiation from the sun. Now you could be forgiven for uh, perhaps Overlooking that fact, it's very obvious, but you could be forgiven, because there's an awful lot of talk about greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect and the effect of uh, carbon dioxide, and uh, we forget that, in fact, what we're doing is influencing how the Earth interacts with the sun. So uh, that is the temperature. Now, it's not only controlled by the output from the sun, it's also controlled by how much energy we on the Earth, the Earth itself, throws back out into space. So the temperature is controlled by the sun. And measuring temperature, the big topic in physics, not just how you measure temperature, but well, it to be how you measure it. It's easy to measure if we're going to take the temperature now in this room. But how are we going to take the average temperature of the Earth? Where are we going to take it? How are we going to take the temperature over the Antarctic and over Central Asia? We've got some interesting problems of physics associated with trying to understand something that seems as straightforward as the measurement of temperature of Earth. Then there's precipitation. Well, it isn't tonight, which is great, but it often does rain or snow. And this is controlled by the state of water in the atmosphere. It's controlled by the state of water in the clouds. The whole interaction of clouds with the radiation hitting the Earth is a major research theme in climate physics. We don't know it. We may sit and look at the clouds and think it's all very obvious. We know what's going on, but there's such a lot still to find out. 
And we only get precipitation if the clouds move from a warmer region to a cooler region. And when they get cold enough, they will actually deposit their precipitation. So we need some sort of movement, which brings us on to the third part of the climate that I want to mention, which are the winds. The winds are driven by two things. Convection currents in the atmosphere. Bits of the atmosphere warm up. We'll show some diagrams in a moment, but bits of the atmosphere warm up. As they rise, they suck cold air in underneath. And that's one of the drivers for the wind. It's not the only one, because the other thing that's happening is the Earth's rotating. And that starts to swirl the atmosphere around. And that makes a difference, as we will see. So we'll have a look at these, these two drivers of winds, the convection currents and the Earth's rotation. First of all, here's a nice, rather pretty picture of what happens with convection. And we've got a, what looks like a nice summer's day here. And we've got in the middle of the picture, in red, some warm air. The sun is up in the sky uh, and it's uh, shining on that action road and the air there is warming up. And warm air is less dense and will rise. And when it does that, it doesn't leave a vacuum behind, it draws cold air or cooler air in from around it. Now on that sort of sunny day, in that sort of scenario, we're not going to see much in the way of wind, but if we have enough heating, we will see quite severe winds following into the cold air beneath. So that's one of the major ways in which air movement and winds are driven. The other is the Earth's rotation, and this is a really busy diagram, but what I really want to show you is, let's see up here, first of all, the Earth is rotating, and what we've got as a result of that are some prevailing wind tendencies. And we've got near the equator, the wind tends to be drawn in uh, this direction, which is sort of right to left, because it's predominantly warmer air that's causing the wind. As we go further north and the air is getting colder, it's coming down towards the Earth and it tends to be going in the opposite direction. But you have, just as a result of the <coughs> rotation of the Earth, distinct patterns of wind uh, as you go from the North Pole through the tropical regions back to the South Pole. And although we've got these rather complicated bursts, this is a sort of diagram of what's happening in an individual convection current, effectively. So we have these convection currents around in these zones uh, as the air is doing what we said it would do, rising where it gets hot and cooling down and coming down again and circulating like that. But the effect, the net effect, is of these zones of well-defined wind. Now why do we have such bad winds in the winter? Well, it's not entirely clear, but it's to do with the, the changes in the atmosphere around about this zone here and uh, where, where it was relative to uh, Britain. But what the effect was, devastating and I think to an extent unprecedented high winds around our coasts. And so winds are an important part of the everyday world of physics and the weather. There's some other things make a difference to our weather. One is the extent of the ice mass. Now ice is interesting stuff because it's very difficult to heat up and to melt. It takes a lot of energy. And if you have a lot of ice, as we have a reasonable amount of ice in the polar regions, then that acts as an energy sink. And melting it is really difficult. Um, it takes, as I say, quite high amounts of energy. And if you have a high, uh, large ice mass, it will tend to be uh, reasonably stable. It will do its best to sustain itself in place. And that makes a total difference, an overall difference to the climate on Earth. Now, there's a bit of discussion about what's happening to the ice masses of the poles, and it depends which authority you read. At this stage, I'm not going to take signs, but uh, they certainly are not melting at the rate that it means that all the polar bears are going to float away on little uh, ice flows and die in the sun. Um, so that is a bit of an exaggeration, um, but there is, as I say, some discussion. And in the end, it's going to come down to something I'll come back to, which is measurement. How do we know whether there are changes and how reliable 
are the sort of pictures that we're looking at. <coughs> okay, so that's one thing. The extent of the ice mass is another factor that makes a difference to climate. Second thing on this slide is the Earth's orbit around the Sun and its tilt. The Earth does not go around the Sun in a circle, it goes around in an ellipse, which means that some of the year it's further away from the Sun than others. When it's further away from the Sun, it's colder. When it's near the Sun, it's warm. So that's one of the factors that makes a difference. Another factor is the tilt. The Earth is you know, tilted upright, it's tilted at an angle, and so we have parts of the Earth pointing towards the Sun at different times. And all of these things make a difference to the climate, just as well it did. Otherwise, we'd be stuck in permanent winter or permanent summer. So, the third thing is the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And I want to spend a bit of time talking about that. The greenhouse effect and greenhouse gases. So, we'll have a look then at these effects and how they influence climate. But as I've already mentioned, a really critical part of climate science is the ability to make a measurement. And it's quite difficult to do. <laughs> One question is, we say, well, what about just using historical data? We know there have been people from way, way back, 200 years or so, even more, recording the temperature. We know, for example, that there was a night in 1707 when it got to be minus 12 centigrade at Upminster. Somebody was writing it all down and keeping a diary. The problem with that is, one of the things that affects the temperature is the, what we would call the state of urbanisation. In other words, if you start building houses and roads round somewhere, it heats up. Not a lot, but enough to make a difference. And everywhere has expanded. I mean, there was a, a, a very interesting case, about 100, I don't know, 60 years ago, one of the early times, Victorian times, there was a new scientific society formed in London. And a whole lot of new scientific societies. But this particular one was formed, and they invited various people who were active to join, and somebody wrote back and said, I can't join, I live too far away from London. And he lived in Islington. Now we think that's funny, because Islington, it's all part of London, isn't it? Well, actually no, it wasn't. It was greenfields, it was rural. So if you'd been taking your temperatures in Islington in 1840, you would have got a different temperature. You'd got, on average, a lower temperature than what you would do if you took the temperatures in Islington now. Just because we've got roads to Islington, we built houses in Islington, we've urbanised it. So you can't just look at historical data and know whether it's changing. You have to take a bit of a decision about it. You look at it and interpret what it tells you. It doesn't tell you what you necessarily think it is. Another big question is how do we determine the average? And if I said to you, what's the average temperature on Earth? If we go away and you look it up, you look it up on the internet, the answer is 14 degrees centigrade. But how do you know? I don't mean you, how do you know, how do you know the internet's reliable? What's an average? What's an average temperature? Antarctica can go down to minus 58. Australia, when a friend of mine was there five or six years ago, was up to 51 degrees at Christmas, plus 51. What's the average? How do you know? And then we take the average of all the places that we've got easy access to, we wander in there with our thermometers, hop down the road to, we used to have a weather station at Kew, that was uh, an important weather station for a long time, so go down to Kew and take the measurement there. Well, how, is, how is that a better average in the middle of the Russian republics or middle of Antarctica? So how do you determine the average? Well, we have to have a decision. We have to decide how to do it. But we have to do it by kind of manipulating the figures a bit. So we have a real problem about the measurement here. The last one is unreliability of measurement devices. And anyone who's ever done any science at all will know about the unreliability of measurement devices. But there used to be a phrase that ended up with, it doesn't work, it's physics. And uh, if anybody's ever worked in a school lab, will say, well, yeah, I know why, because some clock's broken the thermometer, and the mercury's all in the puddle in the drain, and it's not pushing up, they measure temperature. Or something else has gone wrong. But it's not only that. People send satellites up into orbit, and any of the detecting devices 
have a sort of limited time. They drift. They sort of they, they don't work as well. They get old, like a lot of us. And they it's just a little one for the people of my generation in the audience. Um, so they they don't get the people to quite the same measurements. And if you have a, a satellite, the other thing that can happen is it can drift very slightly off course. So you're not necessarily measuring part of the same the sort of same part of the Earth's surface. So you can have unreliability. You need to have some idea where you're measuring devices and perhaps drifting and what's happening. So it's actually very difficult to start making the measurements. In one day, it's a live topic, a live subject, with lots of uh, interactions from uh, important physicists. So that's some of the problems. Now let's go on a bit more and think about our uh, energy <coughs> and where we get it from and why our climate is driven by the sun. Here we've got this, the sun, where we get our energy from. Uh, it's transmitted across space by radiation. Radiation, that form of energy transmission that we cross a vacuum, and we get our energy <coughs> in the form of electromagnetic radiation from the sun. And the Earth, as a, a planet, isn't all that grateful. As you can see, it does here. It reflects about 30% back out into space, so it only keeps about 70%. Uh, and in fact, it keeps slightly more than it might if we didn't have the greenhouse gases, as you will see. So uh, it's it's reflecting some of that energy back out. So we have we retain about 70% of the energy from the sun. Now here's a picture of the sun. You can't just go out and look at the sun because it's, it's dark. Bad idea to look at the sun, and the sun is a very well studied celestial object. And here's the sort of thing that we know about it it's what is described as a medium yellow star, uh, and that tells us quite a lot about where it is in the evolution of uh, its lifetime as a celestial body. We know about the colors of stars, we know about sizes, and so on. So, this is what our sun is. We know what it's made of, mainly hydrogen and helium. It's about three to one. There are a few other elements because they're being produced in the core. And we know roughly, uh, we're going to be to know very precisely what's happening. The temperature in the middle of the sun is about this, 15 times 10 to the 6 degrees centigrade. I actually got this originally in Kelvin, but I wasn't going to explain the difference. The difference is so small to get to the sort of temperature. So it's extraordinarily unimaginably hot in the centre. In fact, it's unimaginably hot even when you get to the surroundings. And it's relatively stable, which is a mercy, although it's not completely stable. There is good evidence that the output of energy from the sun varies. And there is also evidence that it has varied by, in the sun's terms, quite a lot over history. So uh, its output has fallen by up to 0.5%, uh, which we might think is nothing, but it has made a difference. On the surface of the sun, as we've known for a long time, are sunspots. And when there are a lot of sunspots, the sun is throwing out energy at its maximum level. And as the energy goes down, so the sunspot activity goes down, there are fewer sunspots. Now we don't know which causes which, or whether they are both caused by a third unidentified phenomenon, but there is this reduction in output from the sun. And it's actually been plotted. People have used various devices, uh, historical indirect evidence, clearly we're not taking temperatures, but they've, they've taken uh, a number of measurements over the years and worked out a sort of cycle of solar events. Now, in fact, what they've done here is look at they've looked at carbon-14 analysis, and that has given them information about plant growth, and has given them ideas about whether it was warm or cold. So, for example, over here, we have this relatively long period called the medieval maxim. And so for a, a long time, medieval times, the Earth was relatively warm because the Sun was relatively active, and uh, we got used to, apparently, uh, nice warm summers and mild winters. But there have been a series of minima. Now, we know about this one, the Maunda minimum, because by the time of the Maunda minimum, which ran from approximately 1645 to 1715, there were scientists 
observing the sun, not looking at it with a telescope, they weren't that foolish, but certainly taking images and certainly looking at sunspots. So we know for certain that the Maunder minimum was associated with periods of low output from the sorry, low sunspot activity. We also know that it was associated with low outputs from the sun, at least indirectly, because it was extremely cold. So here we are, just to note what I've been saying, the minima appear to be associated with juice energy output, and the more the minimum it was known to be associated with very cold weather. And here are some diary entries from a man called John Evelyn, who was a famous diarist, and he was writing about a particular winter, but this, these winters were fairly typical. So first uh, entry that is relevant, on the 2nd of January, 1684, he tells us the Thames is frozen. Now that means the river was frozen right across it. And what happens now, by the 19th, I went across the Thames on the ice, now become so thick as to bear streets of foods in which they roasted meat. People were living, well not living literally, with the cows, but they were going out there, they were roasting meat, they were having parties, on the river, literally on the river, because it was so thick with ice. And by the 26th of January, the tent is filled with people in tents, selling all sorts of wares in the city. The city meaning the city they just built temporarily on the frozen river. And on the 18th of February, 1684, the tent is still frozen. Then we have a number of pictures. This is actually a frost fair from about seven years before uh, Evelyn's uh, diary entry, so you can see this was a fairly regular annual event. These are the kind of, uh, here it is, these are some tents people were erecting, the booths they were trading from. Here is a stagecoach on the river, and uh, people are able to walk across it. Now, this it was strong evidence that it was cold. Here's a slightly more recent one, because there was another little uh, period of not such detailed minima um, in the early 1800s. But I like this one. I want to show this one because there's St. Paul's Cathedral out there. They are definitely on the, on the river, walking across it. And amazing to me, they are roasting oxes on the Thames. So that ice was pretty thick because I think even in uh, whatever we're talking about, this is about 1815. Uh, you, had, you had a fire to roast an ox, it was going to get hot and melt some of the ice. So the ice must have been really thick for that not to cause it to fall through. So these frost fairs were a feature of life when the weather was bad, where we had kicking, when we had the warm dominion. Now, there's still research going on into this. There's still a bit of debate about what this was all about. Was it that uh, we had uh, an event that partly drives the sunspot activity? partly drives the sun's output, and how reliable is the sort of evidence that we've got, because we haven't got temperature measurements, except for the last periods where we've definitely got these pictures of the frozen heads. And it's just worth recording that the, there's a little bit of a local variation. We're not anywhere near a Maunder minimum, but we are currently at an 11-year minimum in sunspot activity. 11 years ago, there were something like 155 observable spots on the sun. At the moment, there are something like 6 to 8. And there be, it's been like that since about 2009. And the question is, is that why recent winters have been cold? You might say, well, they haven't been. Well, they have. Uh, in North America, it was incredibly cold. At Chicago Air Airport, they recorded the lowest temperature there ever, at minus 27 degrees centigrade. So, North America was hit by a really cold spell this winter. And our previous winters, the last two or three years, have been cold. Now, I don't know if that's just weather or if it's climate, but there is some indi indication that there have been some, some evidence of coolness. And I'm only asking the question, merely as an outsider, not a climate physicist, but here is climate, here is the weather, and it's important. So, as I said, climate research, not just historical, it's up to date. Here are some satellites being used for remote weather sensing. And it's worth mentioning that they do not take the temperature directly. What they do is measure the wavelength of radiation that's coming off the Earth. They measure different wavelengths. Then they have a little bit of a problem because you have to sort of 
put this data together and guess the temperature, no, not guess, calculate the temperature. How do you put the, the, the calculation together? Well, there are a number of mathematical models. So it turns out that people who are responsible for the satellite measurements and taking them, uh, and dealing with them, actually use slightly different equations to estimate the temperature. So in the end, what you find is that people don't try and calculate a meaningful average. We might guess an average of 14 degrees, but they tend to say, let's take something uh, and we'll have an average over the last five or 10 years, and we'll have a look and see whether the weather at the moment, whether the temperature at the moment is different significantly from that average. So we tend to look at differences from defined averages. So then we know, if one person's mathematical equation gives a, a different absolute number, it doesn't matter because we're both going to see whether we've got a big spike or whether we've got something in low spells. And then I want to go on to the greenhouse effect. We've all heard lots about the greenhouse effect, and everybody thinks it's going to be the death of the planet. Well, we ought to be fair and say before we start that the greenhouse effect is actually partly responsible for the life of the planet. There are three gases that cause the so-called greenhouse effect, carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor. And again, we concentrate on carbon dioxide because it looks like that's the one that we can make the biggest difference to. Though in fact, man-made activity is contributing to methane uptake because of our farming practices, increased number of cattle. I'm not going to go to the biology of how they generate methane because it's coarse, but they do generate methane and they contribute to the greenhouse effect. Water vapour, of course, is there anyway, and we can't do a lot about that. And what is the greenhouse effect? Well, what it is, is that energy is absorbed by these gases, and then it's re-emitted, only instead of it just being beamed back out into space, it's now re-emitted in all directions, including downwards, so the Earth's surface gets warmed up, and the Earth's lower atmosphere gets warmed up. So we end up with the whole system being warmer than it otherwise have been uh, without that greenhouse effect. And here's a little picture of the greenhouse effect. So on the uh, left of the screen you can see the sun beaming its radiation and it's reflecting. So one lot, I told you we weren't going to be grateful because we throw 30% of it straight back out into space. That's going back out there. Forget that bit, you don't want that, thank you very much. But then we get some that is going to be reflected out but then starts to be absorbed by our greenhouse gases and then we have some of them being, some of the energy being re-emitted and going out of the atmosphere, but some being re-emitted and coming back down towards the Earth's surface. So we end up with a generalised warming effect. And the whole point about the greenhouse effect is it's not all bad. It's not all bad because without any greenhouse gases, the Earth's temperature, well, we think it's 14, we calculate it would be minus 80. And if it was minus 18, it would be too cold for us to live on Earth, or, be, or anything to live on Earth. So we need the greenhouse effect. We may have turned it up a bit too much, but we certainly need it. And we have to be very careful about it. And I said here, the precise effects are still being studied. The atmosphere is extremely complicated. And I don't say that just because uh, a, a sort of politically motivated uh, individuals who deny climate change. Climate change is clearly happening because climate changes all the time, but it's really foolish to say it's not happening. Um, but we have to be a bit careful with some of the people who don't just do anything about it. The reality of the situation, though, is that the thing is complicated. We had computer predictive models that were saying that the Earth's temperature was rising in line with the increase in carbon dioxide la levels, but that increase has leveled out. We had people looking at the model and predicting with great authority on the basis of the model and the data they then had in the year 2000 that by 2010 there'd be never, no more snow, there'd never see snow again in Britain. Well, uh, that was unfortunately taken out of dust and down by some rather mischievous journalists and published again in 2010 in December when we all snowed in. So we do have snow and we probably won't snow again. The, the model is a bit more complicated, so we have to go on refining our data and refining our model. But the greenhouse effect is certainly there. A build-up of quite a powerful greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide is not a good idea, and clearly things have to be done about it. But 
don't worry about it in one sense, it's not all bad. We're not going to eliminate it completely because we don't need to. And I've talked then about climate. This incredibly complex, sophisticated, subtle system that we almost take for granted and don't know any physics there. But I hope I've shown you that there's plenty of physics there. And now I want to move to probably the most complicated device we've all got, uh, because I want to go on to the mobile phone. And I'm just taking a real cherry-picking approach to physics here, so let's now have a look at mobile phones. What is it about mobile phones and how is it that they exemplify physics? Well, let's remind ourselves of one aspect of physics. Physics is partly concerned with mass, certainly we studied it early on. And here's a piece that we've improved enormously. Uh, the first portable phone, as you can see there, was developed in 1973 and it weighed a kilogram. Now, I wouldn't like to put that to the vote whether that is actually portable or not. It doesn't seem very portable to me. Uh, this is what sort of thing it looked like. <laughs> this, uh, this guy thinks he's incredibly cool in about 1987. And there are two things to note about him. Not only has he got a, a mobile phone the size of a brick, he's still got a watch. Now, I'm old-fashioned, I wear a watch, but, you know, what about incorporating the timekeeping in the mobile phone? In fact, we took the picture of somebody with a camera. This is not a selfie. So, all these things this poor man couldn't do only uh, 25, <coughs> seven years ago. So, there we are, there's a mobile phone when they were first launched as items that people might have, and very few people rather ostentatiously had them, and they were not very mobile. And here, then, is our evolutionary tree of the mobile phone, starting at the far end with a very similar device, the one we've just seen. Very big, very clunky, no tools on it except the ability to make a phone call, which is not too bad, that's what you really want to begin with. But compared to what happens when we get down to this end, and we have a whole variety of devices, we have the computer screen with a whole load of apps on it, uh, much lighter, totally miniaturized, and able to do so much more. And the evolution of mobile phone as this technology is just breathtaking. And it's one of those things, it's just amazing. We don't get out our mobile phones and just look at them. We just complete silence and wonder. And they're just amazing devices. And the physics that's gone into them is fantastic. The physics of new materials. We've got on these modern materials, we've got a liquid crystal display. Uh, we've got inside batteries operating with extremely sophisticated technology. And in fact, the reason that that phone down there was so enormous, and this one down here is so slim and stylish, the biggest driver for that is the change in battery technology. We now have battery technology that wasn't even available when people tried to make mobile phones in the 1980s. Here, by the way, is the modern mobile phone. I actually don't own a modern mobile phone. I own something that's fairly antediluvian. It's not quite two of these on a string, but it's that sort of thing. Um, and so I have to have a picture of a mobile phone to prove I'm in the beginning of the 21st century. So there we are, here's a mobile phone. But you can see all the sort of uh, options and so on that you get from in what's a very, very small and very light device. Now what is a mobile phone? Well, it's essentially a radio transmitter and a radio receiver. And that's probably why those earliest phones look like walkie-talkies, because that's effectively what we had. Only a walkie-talkie operates on a particular uh, radio frequency, and our mobile phone operates through cells, and indeed some people would call them cell phones. And the cells are really the important, rather clever device that goes with the mobile phone. It's all clever, really, but this is also a very clever piece of work that's been done to develop these. And what happens is we have a whole series of cell networks. Uh, if we wanted to use radio frequency, there are only about 800 radio frequencies, radio wavelengths are available. So you only have 400 people with a mobile phone and the whole system would be clogged up. Unless you had this, because what happens is that each of these is a cell with an area in the middle. They're now roughly hexagonal. And so when you get your mobile phone out, and you might be here in zone F2, you start dialing your signal, your radio uh, transmitter, sends a signal to the mask, and your message is passed on um, at whatever wavelength happens to be available, but you can keep reusing the wavelengths because all your neighbours 
is use exactly the same wavelength without interfering with your form. And that's the beauty of the mobile phone and the cell network. So the network's needed because there are only a limited number of radio frequencies available. As I say, about 800, which means by the time you've got something set up to receive and talk, we could live in radio cell phones just to make other people unless we had the cells. And by using this, we can keep reusing the frequencies. And there's, we have to have a lot of uh, mass per unit area. We have to have a, a cell about 10 square miles or a bit smaller in cities. I'm not sure what they are around here, but if you have a look at where the mobile phone masts are, they are probably smaller than, considerably smaller than 10 square miles. Um, so the cells are really small. And uh, by having them close together and able to transmit, we are able to use the same radio frequency again and again. And this is the, <coughs> this is the mast. Um, these are items of, for some reason, incredible horror. I know the Daily Mail says they give you cancer, but the Daily Mail says everything gives you cancer. If you live long enough, uh, you probably have survived every disease and cancer scare in the Daily Mail. There is actually zero clinical evidence of any effect measurable, and they have repeatedly measured and measured and measured again uh, the influence of mobile phone masks. The Daily Mail will suddenly tell you that, oh, well, down this street they put a mask up and five people died of cancer. Now, they don't seem to know that they might have died, would have died of cancer, haven't put the mask up. You just have to look at the spread of cancers and the statistical probability of cancers. That, um, you know, intelligence is wasted on some people, and in this case, I'm not going any further. But, you know, we, we've got to have these things. We want to use a cell phone, and we want to use a mobile phone. We have to have these kind of devices. They're not particularly aesthetic, but they do take a bit of looking for. They normally are painted these nice, uh, I'm not sure what the colour is, but it's sort of grey. You just kind of don't notice it unless you're suddenly on the lookout, and then you realize just how many of them there are, and how small the cells are. And say, particularly around here, they are very small. This is inside a mobile phone. I did wonder about doing a trick I once saw in a lecture where somebody said, uh, has anybody got a mobile phone, borrowed it and broke it? Because of course what he'd actually done is planted the person in the audience. But the horror of the young people was so great, I think they would still in counselling today. <laughs> see, see a mobile phone broken before your eyes is not a good idea. Um, it's just, you know, and there are some things that people should never see, and I think that was one. Anyway, here is the inside of a mobile phone. I don't know, it's a picky way through it, but you can see what we've got is an awful lot of complexity and these very, very cleverly miniaturized components. The most important, as I said, is the battery, so we'll come on to that in a second. Mobile phones must be light. That's a memo to the guy in 1973 who invented them. One kilogram is too much. They actually only use a small amount of power, and they can only send their signals a short distance. As you can see, these, these cells, we don't have to send them very far, um, so that's okay. But there is a reason for the compactness, and that's the battery, the battery technology. And the batteries that they use are things like this, and again, we can look at those and not be desperately impressed, but the physics of designing these batteries to enable them to pack up the sort of power punch that they do the size they are has been phenomenal. And they are based on lithium ions. Uh, lithium ion movement will carry the charge. And the beauty of the lithium ion system is you can reverse it. So left of their own devices, when you connect the whole circuit, lithium ions will chunter out around the battery, carrying the charge and powering the phone. And when you run out of battery, you plug it into the system. And what happens is those lithium ions, though they might be kicking and screaming, are pushed back by the charger and they go back to where they started. <coughs> and then when you start running the mobile phone again, they will just discharge. And as long as you can keep the lithium ions being uh, either going in the direction they want to and then pushed back, you can keep your mobile phone battery going for a long time. And this technology, this reversible technology, is what's made the difference between mobile phones being Chunky house bricks that only make phone calls, the being devices that you can do so much on, uh, and also being so light. They also, as I mentioned in passing, contain a liquid crystal display screen, and that's again important. The original devices, 
uh, they try to make an alpha batch technology, they try to make a sort of uh, alphanumeric display system, and those are heavy and clunky and cumbersome and not particularly attractive, and so instead they use a liquid crystal display. And so the key feature, and this is a weekly, I'll just warn you of this, the key feature about mobile phones, the hopes of this is they use modern materials. Which brings me on to the last bit of physics I want to explore, which is a little bit about materials and material science. And one of the things that's happened as a result of the application of physics, real understanding of the physical reality of materials, is we've now got some materials with really surprising properties. So, again, materials are things we take for granted in the physical world, but let's have a look at them. Essentially, we've got three classes of material. You might want to argue about the choice, but I think this is the exhaustive list. Glasses and ceramics at the top, polymers or plastics in the middle, and metals. You look and say, well, there must be some things that aren't that. Well, what about wood? It's a polymer. It's a naturally occurring polymer. So it may not be a plastic, it might be able to melt it, but it's a polymer. So it, it comes in the category. So this pretty much covers everything. And materials behave differently in general. Uh, you know that, it's obviously. You wouldn't necessarily, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say, you wouldn't necessarily build a car out of wood. It's a stupid thing. Why? Because it's relatively heavy, it's not that strong, and uh, you know, they have other features that are not so attractive about it as well. I think heavy is probably things to decide we're against. So materials have different properties. We're used to the idea, we select materials to an extent without thinking about it. And I want to think about some properties of materials which can be investigated with an extremely simple physical device. And I'm very fond of this device, and if people have heard me lecture before, they'll know about this, my fondness of this device. It's called a hammer. Now, you might not think this is a device for physics, uh, but it is actually, you can get an awful lot of information if you hit things with a hammer. So, here's the start, let's have a look at metals. Now metals, quite conveniently, will bend. Uh, here's actually not a hammer, it's a mallet, but you know you're making this rather elaborate trumpet piece, and so you can bend the metal. Now, it's not always good news that metals will bend, because occasionally you can do that sort of thing. Uh, only the advantage is, Wait, I'm entirely doing this, but effectively you can pull that part of the lamppost and you can get the hammers and you can hit out the vents. You may have to do it entirely, they'll be a bit weaker, but there are some of those bits that could be straightened out with a hammer. So you could be back to where you started from. So metals will bend. But glass won't. You hit that with a hammer and glass will shatter. So it's a different sort of material. Okay, we're just used to that. In that case, we won't build our cars out of glass. So, what's the problem? Well, there are some things we want to do that have some of the properties of glass in so we will have a think about this. Some materials, here's an example, number of rubber resists changing shape completely. Now, rubber is an example of a polymer, not actually plastic, I don't think we call it plastic, but certainly polymer, of long, thin molecules, and uh, because of that, you get particular properties. So you whack that with a hammer, and the hammer will bounce back. So some materials can resist changing shape completely. But here's our tractor tire that we do now. So we've really got three types of material. Quite used to this idea, just investigating with a hammer. And what we can see is those materials that resist bending, breaking, whatever, we tend to call tough. And if we add polymers, the brittle materials, like glass, we can have some surprising results. Well, the first one I want to show you is not glass, but concrete. Now, concrete's a brittle material. We all agree with that. Concrete is rock hard, quite useful for building things, but if somebody came along with a sledgehammer, they'd not have the wall. Well, not necessarily. Here's a little bit of research down at the University of Michigan. They've got this stuff which they don't call flexicrete. They put polymers in there and they can bend these lumps of concrete. Now, I want to remind you what this is. This is concrete. This is good, ordinary concrete with a blend of uh, a rubber in it. So you start to get some materials with really bizarre properties. And if you go far enough, you can actually make springs out of this stuff. I mean, bouncing springs out of concrete. Amazing. Just by understanding the physics of materials, why they break, how they go wrong. And investigating them with a the hammer and then trying to improve them 
by blending materials. Another one is glass. Now we're used to the idea, you take a hammer to your bottle, as I showed, it will break. But here's somebody, I don't know if they've taken a hammer to this, they possibly have, we're used to the idea of having cut and glass in the windscreen of our cars. Now it's not fantastic, it's still broken, but it certainly hasn't given lots of little shards landing in the driver's lap. Um, it certainly hasn't caused the sort of breakage that uh, the bottle had, and so we toughened it. Now, toughened glass is made by a lamination process. You've got two glass pieces of glass, and you basically put a sheet of clear plastic between them. So just very simply, by doing something like that, we change the physics of a well-known material. I might think, well, this is obvious, we've known about cup and glass for a long time. Yes, we have, but if you go back even a hundred years, the idea that you might have something like a windscreen that wouldn't break to bits if you hit it with a hammer, it seemed like something close to magic. So, just again, by understanding materials and materials physics, we've got to this sort of process. Now, glass is an interesting material. It's incredibly brittle. It's useful, we don't mind. For a whole variety of reasons for a long time, and true glass is amorphous. That means to say the atoms and molecules that make it up don't quite know where to sit, so it's a random array. It's weak and brittle because it cracks itself. So if you hit it with a hammer, the cracks go whizzing through it and the whole thing breaks up. So we've seen that you could deal with that in our laminated glass, but another thing you can do is you can partly crystallize it heat the glass back up again, and you can coax the molecules to move to where they'd rather sit down and form little crystals. And when you do that, you find you've got something that's got really, really strong, tiny zones, and they resist crack growth. The crack whizzes in, hits the, the zone, and can't go further. So the material is strong. And we, we, those materials are called glass ceramics. Now, they look like a piece of glass, but they are uh, actually called glass ceramics, and they have got a ceramic nature. Now, here's a classic that you can do with glass. It's not investigating with a hammer, it's investigating with another physical phenomenon, which is hot water. Pour hot water into a glass, pour boiling water into a glass object, and you can get this sort of thing happening. You can get fractured just like that. Why? Because the interior of the glass heats up, expands because it gets hotter, and it pushes against the cooler exterior. The cooler exterior is weak, so it cracks and up. You make a glass ceramic, you can avoid this problem. I'm not suggesting you make glass ceramic uh, jugs, although we do have uh, Pyrex, which is uh, a partly crystal, a very slightly crystallized material, um, works by slightly other effects, but more significantly, we've got something like this a glass sheet, a glass ceramic sheet, as a whole. Again, it's a very everyday item, and people may not realize how remarkable it is. You've effectively got what looks like a sheet of glass, and you can heat it up with these electrical heaters, and it doesn't crack. You couldn't do that if it wasn't a glass ceramic. You couldn't do that without the contribution of materials physicists. You're only concerned, as somebody is here, with frying some eggs. But actually, you're using a fantastic piece of development that we thank physics for. Okay, so I'm coming to the end now. Very quickly, I hope I've shown that physics, physics is everything about understanding the physical world. And if we go right, we can probe all the way back to the origin of the universe. There's nothing, no time scale, no length scale that we're not involved in. And I've shown, I hope, through my examples that we can use physics to understand climate, we can enjoy our improved communications and we can have better materials. So that's my serious conclusion. Before that, I'd like to have one more quote from the man himself, Albert Einstein. He told us that you shouldn't be able to explain the laws of physics to a barman. And in a few minutes' time, I'm going out of the pub. Thank you.